watching eSports Center and we're here with Charles Murray for Game Central. We're about to get in the zone and figure out who are the top shooters for the games that they play at SUNY Canton and soon SUNY wide. Charles, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Erica. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So we got to know what games are SUNY Canton playing, or the teams at SUNY Canton playing, and how do you select these games? Which ones are the most popular amongst, amongst your players? Yeah, so great question. We actually put it up to a vote. So I, at Canton, it's a very student-first esports program. So I let my students decide every semester. I'll put out a survey and say, hey, what game do you want to play next semester? Uh, if they like the game they play currently, they will vote for that game they play currently. If they want to add another, they will do that. And ultimately, I'll take what's the most requested, and then I'll find a league for them to play in. And that ultimately brings, I guess, the most to the student, really, the, you know, the group that I'm here to serve. And the, the games that we're playing are, are all the big popular ones right now. League of Legends, Fortnite, Overwatch, Rocket League, Madden. Uh, we had FIFA, but we've, um, we've moved away from FIFA. We're focusing more on Madden. Um, and Rainbow Six Siege being our tactical first-person experience game. It's, uh, we had the gambit. We had almost every niche of the gaming community covered. So every year, every semester, you can kind of rotate new games in, take some games out, depending on what's popular amongst the players at that time. And I'm assuming the teams that you have are developing skills and participating in other types of games throughout the semester that eventually make its way to the top of the list. Oh, yeah. So some games come, some games go. Uh, one game we used to have is Hearthstone, and that game is a, it's like a card game, and many of the players left Hearthstone to join the League of Legends team. So there is an ebb and flow in the game community that uh, our students are always, you know, they're always cognizant of it. That's great. So it really gives them an, an opportunity to expand their skill sets to different types of games. Do you find that players that are participating in genres like battle arenas or top shooting type of games or real-time strategy games that they're likely to stick within that genre, or is it uh, pretty common for them to switch in between them as they go through the semester or many semesters? Yeah, that's a great question. And you're actually, you're really close to it. It's uh, a lot of the students stay within their genre. If they are a person that clicks heads, they're a first person shooter, they will stay likely in the first person shooter genre and that goes for the rest of the genres. It's very rare that you see a student actually break their genre. Um, it's something that's actually, um, when you get to the level of competitiveness that we are at, it's very difficult to break out of your genre. You specialize to the point uh, where you, you are good at an extremely niche thing to break out is, is difficult. So it's only for the very bravest that they do jump ship to a different genre. Well, we're going to have some of your team team members that are joining the qualifier matches within the Level Up Arcade later this afternoon. They're going to have the opportunity to win first place and play with pro gamers day two of our virtual event here, which is very exciting. Tell me a little bit about some of those players that are top ranked in your league. Yeah, so we have quite a number of top ranked players in the SUNY Canton Esports program. Uh, the captains mainly being the dominant players. I've promoted most of my best players to captains of their teams. So Dylan Santiago is uh, top 2,000 in the world at the game Fortnite. He's an incredible Fortnite player. Um, considering millions play the game, it's, it's quite impressive, and he maintains his top 2,000 rank, and it takes him every day. Uh, there is another player in my program who's the captain of the team that I coach. Uh, his name is Cal, and he is top 200 in North America for the game Overwatch. And, uh, you know, we've got other players that are top 1%. Basically, if you're in the collegiate program here, you're, you're about the top 1% out of any gaming community. So we got the top-ranked players coming straight out of SUNY Canton, part of the ECAC League. Don't miss watching them tonight in the qualifier matches of the Level Up Arcade on Twitch on Esports U Network. And of course, if you want to continue playing in those matches, pick up some arcade game schedules. We have ECAC Esports Twitch channels where you can play to your heart's desire. Thank you, Charlie. I'm looking forward to seeing those players tonight and hearing from them later today. Up next, we have Layla and Claire joining us from the North America Scholastic Esports Federation once again. And they're gonna to talk to us about just how far gamers will go to play. Layla and Claire back again from NASIP. You guys have a huge student body participating in your leagues. I got to know what are the 
most popular games that make up the tournaments? Sure. Um, we, well, first off, we don't say, here's what we're going to offer this year. We ask the students, what do you want to play? Because, you know, maybe they'll come up with something that you weren't expecting. So this fall, we're excited. We're offering Overwatch and also Rocket League. Those have been both really high on kids' lists. This is the first time we're offering Rocket League. And let me tell you that the response from the students has been fantastic when they heard that that's going to be out there. Um, and awesome. not only do we have those top two titles, we have many others that we'll be offering. So um, we bring whatever it is that the kids are interested at the moment, that is what we're offering. Um, in addition so to the choice, games, Julie. gamer's choice, exactly, exactly. And who doesn't want to say what they want to play, right? It's very important. Absolutely. The other thing we do besides the games is we have what we call beyond the game challenges. So if you're a student and you're, maybe you're not the best Rocket League player, but you still want to be really involved, we have beyond the game challenges. So you can enter, and if you're great at streaming, enter the category for streaming, and you can actually win a scholarship for that. So beyond the games, we have all kinds of opportunities for kids to join in and play wherever it fits with their unique bent. That's so cool. You guys offer scholarships just for entering the day, things like game day challenge. Where does that, the scholarship funds go once the student receives them? So we don't offer prizes. We actually offer scholarships and we offer internships and mentorships, things that are really valuable, not just in that moment, but in their futures. So mm -hmm. when students win scholarship uh, money for a, a successful tournament, we hold that for them until they go to college and then it's released by a third party, essentially a, kind of a, a bank for scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really, really valued by our school partners and teachers because we're always connecting esports and, sc and scholasticism and academics because as we're investing in your future and, and that future is your career in STEM hopefully uh, and college. You know learning all of this and the opportunities that you guys are providing for kids I was never that big on gaming growing up. Nintendo was my jam, Super <laughs> Mario Brothers, I'm there all day but beyond that it really didn't catch on too much but I noticed that there's players that are involved in the team that don't even play. They're shoutcasters. They're doing the social media strategy. They're graphic design and supporting the teams in so many different types of way, broadcasting, right? So I think I'm a little bit jealous that I can't go back and actually do something like that when I was in college. That's awesome to see how the kids are able to build up scholarship funds for the future and apply what they love to a passion that they have with esports. Very cool. But I know that kids will go pretty far to get what they want. Where there's a will, there's a way, and they're testing boundaries all the time. So Layla, how far will those kids go to play? Well, you know, we focus on a code of conduct first and foremost in NASAF, you know, digital citizenship and teaching our students to take care of their own network, to take care of their own club and their own devices because it's their team. That's the very first thing we do. Kids, we have a code of conduct, but kids can also write their own so that they can regulate themselves and regulate each other. And it works. In fact, our research has shown that the, one of the greatest impacts in terms of social emotional learning from NASAF is self-regulation and self-awareness. And it's true that unless you really implement the program like that, you know, really purposefully, kids can go pretty far. In one example, when we were just testing um, a, a, an open device in a standard computer lab where uh, the ports were open, probably, and you know, it was not a dedicated device for esports, probably within about 15 minutes, they had downloaded, I think, almost 300 games and other types of really inappropriate material that you do not want to have on your network. So network security is extremely important, having that relationship and understanding with your IT department about what esports is and how to manage that. We work really closely with schools and that IT department, the handshake again between education and IT has to be strong and firm, but also working with your students so that they take care of the network, they respect it and they respect their team because the concept consequence on our end, you know, is if you don't abide by the code of conduct, you can't play. And if you don't protect your network, you're really not going to be able to play. So it's about giving kids time to own, own esports and, and, and make it a really positive experience for all and headache free for IT. Headache free for IT. Yes, please. Because you don't want esports to be uh, a bane in their existence or right. vice versa. The IT's got to, there's got to be a, a good relationship and, um, you know, 
integration between the services on, that IT is providing to enable esports and how the students are leveraging that, that opportunity, that platform, the accessibility that they have to be able to play games on the campus or at home. But to hack into a computer with an open port that happened to be in that classroom just to download 300 games, I'm wondering where the logic is, but I'm sure, you know, young minds are still forming. Think like a teenager. <laughs> Well, you know, yeah. networks are so typically closed down. So when a teenager sees something that they see as an open port, they're going to go through it like, you know, Alice in Wonderland. The great thing is that most IT um, help uh, leaders even and tech assistants are actually all gamers themselves. And when they work with NACEF, they say, man, I really wish I'd had a program. So they uh, like that when I was in high school, because, you know, w how that would have helped me grow. So IT with esports, it's a really, it, they're, they understand what we're doing and they want to work with us because they understand that we're protecting the network with them and they're not going to have issues with updates. Testing times will always be sacrosanct. Um, we're working with them on which ports we give them IT FAQs and we'll work closely with them until it meets everyone's requirements. So you guys work with the school's IT department rather than putting that that onus on the educators themselves who may not be comfortable or tax, tech savvy enough to even know what questions to ask or what information to share. Really good educators know that esports is hot and it's exciting for kids but the discomfort is they don't know the game or they're questioning the IT um, they really want to uh, speak to district administrators or their school like you know their school principals but they want to have all of their ducks aligned right in a row so they you know they present a, gr a really great case so when we work with school districts or with teachers we ask and we tackle all of those questions you know like tackling and blocking and we work yeah. with providers like so let's let's look at your network what ports should be open what are best practices with you know with IT having the conversation with IT at the table and esports and us at the table all together to work it out and test test your network that's really the best way to do it so that when you do launch your team it's a great experience for everybody I couldn't agree more I mean all of you watching here today probably watching on the while attending extreme connect and networking is is what we do right it's our it's our our bread and and, and I lost that phrase I'm gonna go with bread and oil feels right um, <laughs> Those two things are great together. Anyway, brain fart, but this is what we do, right? The network is the critical foundational layer to anything that we do. There's, I challenge you to think of one task you do in the day that doesn't involve technology of sorts. It's, it's impossible. So with that said, I mean, there's so, so many touch points and data points and user activity, all these things interacting with the network, you throw esports on top of that and players uh, willingness and urgency to play, you got to lock down those ports and zone off your environments to make sure that you're protecting data, protecting your network, um, you know, keeping security top of mind while not degrading the experience in the classroom. We've got digital classrooms, we've got online, online le lessons going on all the time. And it's just being adopted so much more widely across the board that I think it's, it's more critical now than ever that the network is is secured properly because you have so many more uh, people, things, uh, applications interacting with it now, right? There's nothing we do that- Yeah, doesn't... you know, especially now because we will have in a school district, you'll have maybe the, a pop-up one or two teams, but that's gonna scale out and grow. So, you know, maybe having one a one-off team uh, or club, you'll, you'll address those issues at the time, but really a school district that recognizes the growth of esports prepares for that growth. So what is that, what is the impact across the entire network? And so that the students get the opportunity. At the end of the day, schools are, um, you know, we're focused on yeah. students and student growth. So the, I, you know, making sure that IT supports that in every single way, that's how we work together. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking about, like you said, if they start small, maybe they feel like, well, we don't need to address the network right now. We have what we need. And that may be true, but the best practices that you're talking mm -hmm. about, that segmentation, the security measures uh, and parameters and boundaries and code of conduct for the, mm -hmm. the kids and how they, how they engage with the systems you're offering for them to play on, 
Um, all of those things can be set well before you reach that growth. It's much harder to create those practices once you've experienced that growth than to create it in the beginning and, and grow with that, right? Did, yeah, you, mm -hmm. digital citizen, a citizen, you know, ho hopefully doesn't steal. A citizen doesn't, uh, you know, fraudulently vote. A digital citizen doesn't play with the port. It doesn't, you know, doesn't uh, put, they don't. And they, and they, and they, they're not toxic online. They don't bully, they're supportive. So it's the IT part, you know, working with IT, making sure that those best practices are there. Uh, and what, and if there's a problem, having a really great mitigation response uh, so that the, that the student experience, the academic experience is untouched. And on the other side as well, right? You want to make sure that the citizenship of the student to be able to say, I'm growing my own team and I'm taking responsibility for it. What hopefully that, you know, and I think we've, we have seen it already at NASEF, is that students that take responsibility for that IT, they say, you know what, I really like that job. Maybe I'm going to go and be an IT administrator. And they, they have the conversations with IT. They learn about cybersecurity. They want to, they want to continue it. So all of a sudden IT even becomes part of that esports program and they want to support it. It's a great yeah. valuable conversation to have. That's awesome. So go, you know, going back to Game Central here, I think I know my lesson now. And for yeah. all of you watching, gamers will choose their games. Am I right? They're going to guide you on the games that they want to play. So you know what the the interest is at your school just by asking, hey, what kind of games do you want to play? And you'll be able to grow your program, you know, as you have more interest in more games. But beware, lock down those ports. No, <laughs> don't touch ports. Secure the network because they'll go as far as they need to to make sure they get all of the games they want to play. So, and we're back with the SUNY Canton Ruse, and it's all about Game Central. Cal, Emily, what's going on? Tell me about what your game of choice is and what's most popular for your teams at SUNY Canton? My game of choice, um, when I'm not practicing Overwatch, because that takes up the majority of my time, obviously. Uh, when I'm not playing Overwatch, I actually still like to hop on to another competitive game. I like to play League of Legends a lot. Um, it's just something about this, the strategy and, uh, again, the camaraderie. with the, you, You're with a team and you play to win as a team. Um, I love that a lot. On my downtime, if we're not talking any competitiveness whatsoever, um, I like to play like Sekiro or Stardew Valley, maybe something really slow and chill, something that idly you can idly play like Animal Crossing. <laughs> now you're talking more my level. So tell me a little bit more about League of Legends and Overwatch. I mean, I know we just talked to you about your potential to win in the Arcade Cup to play with Overwatch pros Dante and Linkser, but is League of Legends something you would say is similar as far as the type of game? League of Legends uh, and Overwatch are only similar in the fact that it is a competitive team-based game. Um, the execution of these games are completely different. Um, there is a lot that goes on behind the scenes in League of Legends compared to Overwatch. Overwatch is very surface level um, compared, to, compared to League of Legends. League of Legends is a beast. It's a behemoth. It's probably the number one competitive game, nigh I say, the number one video game in the world with most downloads, most plays, most people who are online every day. Um, and I just even though they're wildly different in terms of play style execution and strategy, I, I like the feeling of playing with a team, winning as a team. And there's always that, the, the metagame, the, the strategy, um, the game isn't, can, has, has several win conditions. You can win um, through, through objective taking, through brawling it out, battling out, winning fights. I, just, is that, I like that kind of game. <laughs> Wow, so you are very competitive and strategic, it seems. So, and if you are the if you're the one that's that's um, that's taking down players in Overwatch, what was the role that you play in, in Overwatch? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I play um, DPS for Overwatch, and uh, for those who might not know what DPS is, um, I do the most damage in the game. So my team is relying on me to get those kills, to get those frags, and to be able to open up the map for my team. So you are just like going after it. I mean, you are a competitor at heart. 
you're taking down all of the, the you're opposing uh, the opposing players. That's your role. Cal, we've talked to you before about your support role on the Overwatch team. What are the types of games that you like outside of Overwatch that might lend towards the skill sets that you're able to exercise in Overwatch? Um, so the games that I like to play are super, super competitive. I have like one game that's not, that's my chill game. Um, they would include League of Legends like Emily. Um, there's the game Apex Legends, which is a battle royale, last squad surviving, which I've been in the top 200 bracket for that on Xbox. Um, there's also games like uh, League of Legends, I'm just going to go back to that, is I'm on the Canton team for that as well. Uh, for that I'm a sub though, since Overwatch is the main. Um, I like games like StarCraft, which is real-time strategy, army builder. Uh, World of Warcraft, I'll do like the arenas, the raids, the best of the best type stuff. Um, but if I was like to chill out, I would just play Sea of Thieves, pirate game, just have fun, sail. It's a beautiful looking game. Charlie, I heard that little snicker over there. So you know what's going on with these players. You know how dedicated they are to their practice time. Tell me a little bit about their routine as a, um, you know, as a team the practice schedule and how they're being organized to strategize for their matches and review the plays after the fact and study their opponent. Yeah, I got a good chuckle out of that because it reminded me of that gaming and, and, and esports is, is not really like a, a, a hobby. It's a profession and it's also a lifestyle. You get into this and you fall down a rabbit hole of all the different games that you end up loving, universes that you can just wrap yourself up in and just be completely lost in them and just be totally happy. Uh, sea of Thieves being a universe that I love playing, the most chill game, you just get on a boat and you just vibe, go fishing, hunt for treasure. Like it's just, it's just the most chill, but talking about specifically how do we prepare what is our practice schedule like? And you know, what do we do for review? So we prepare by having at minimum two practices a week. And then last semester, we were actually in here every day before coronavirus. And then now we're having at minimum two a week. We practice basically within our roles. So yeah. we will queue up as a group, queue up what I mean by that is we will group up in a team of six and go against the world. We'll throw ourselves into the matchmaking system and it will pit us against some of the top players because it will compare you to other people in the system. Well, we're bringing a stacked team of six people. It's gonna only pit us against other stacked teams of six people. That's the way the system is designed. So every time we play, we are sweating. We are, we are absolutely giving it our all. There is, like, there is no real warm up. It's just, hey, deep end of the pool, here we go. So with all of those teams that you guys have, the, all those different types of games, Emily, Cal, how do you guys influence which games are selected for each season at, the, uh, at SUNY Canton with your esports program? Um, I was a, and an, I am a veteran of the um, esport scene here at SUNY Canton. I was around since it was created. And at the beginning, uh, we only offered the, the most basic esports that were in the highest demand. Um, and over time, we have, we really appreciate input. Uh, we want to know what the students on campus are playing, what they're, what they're most passionate about. And we go out and see, you know, can we find an esport scene for them? Can we make this competitive? Can we give these students a team and a place to play and show off their skills? And so we started off with, I think, three. I think we only offered Overwatch, League of Legends, and Hearthstone as competitive games in the beginning and we have then since then expanded our roster to eight different esports here at SUNY Canton. So it really is gamers choice. It's really about the students that you have, the skills that they have, the interests that they have that guides the the games that you guys um, you know put evolve your teams around. Very cool. Well, I love the influence that you guys have. I love the support you give each other within the community, how you help foster students that may want to get into the esports program or 
grow their skill sets and give them that opportunity to really be included and continue to grow your esports club. I mean, like you said, you started with three games. Now you're up to eight. I'm sure it's going to keep growing because you guys are doing an amazing job over at SUNY Canton. I appreciate you guys joining. I'm definitely going to check you guys out tonight in the Level Up Arcade. Good luck to you guys. There you have it. Lockdown ports and make sure you offer games as the interest comes around. Thank you for watching eSports Center. We'll see you next time.